Hello and welcome to this webinar. My name is Nick Meadow from the Garmin Marine Team. Well, as you can see from that video, Garmin provide products for a wide range of users. It could be the professional sailor, cruising sailor, fisherman, power boater. We have specifically designed features and products for each of those users. What I'm going to do today is try to show you, using this emulator, the GPS map chart plotter. Take you through the features and functions and try and explain how you would get the best out of your products and show you what it can do. Before I begin with the emulator, let me tell you about the GPS map series itself. It ranges from our mid-range 7-inch plotter right up to a 24-inch screen, which is really high-end. IPS display, so highest resolutions on the market. You can see them from all different angles as well. But of course, you're not going to put a 24-inch display on a small boat. So a 25, 30 foot ceiling boat might take a seven or a nine inch display. The nine inch is actually our most popular. Whereas on a 40 foot power boat, you might put a 12 or a 16 inch display on there. So some of the things I'm going to cover today are the user interface, using the home page and navigating around the chart plotter, types of charts, Almanac data contained within those charts, including tides and currents, how to use those. I'll touch briefly on sonar and radar. I won't go into too much detail on those because they're hard to demonstrate on this emulator. I'll run through the sailing features and racing features for those uh, racers amongst us. And I'll finish with a very brief introduction to the Quadix 6 Marine Smartwatch. First of all, let me take you back to the origin of this chart plotter. In 2007, we released two new products for the 4000 and 5000 series. They were revolutionary at the time. The 4000 was push button, whereas the 5000 was touch screen. First touch screen in the marine market. At the time, people were saying, oh, touch screen in a marine environment won't work. 13 years later, everybody is making touch screens and we led the way. And ever since then, we've innovated and we first the market with lots of new products. The 5008 also created a new type of user interface. We're all totally used to it now with our smartphones. You press that button at the bottom, it takes you to your homepage with all the apps, and then you just press wherever you want to go from there. That was introduced in the 4 and 5000 series. Now, when you consider in 2007, the iPhone was just released, it shows you how up to date it was back then. And of course, everybody has now followed suit in the same way. The challenge is that we offer this product for lots of different users. Okay, so it's packed full of features. As you can see down the right hand side, we've got charts, sonar, radar, everything packed in there in the simulator. Um, now, you may not want to use that. You know, you may not have radar, uh, you may not want to have sonar. If you don't have those connected, they won't show up. The other thing as well is um, we also have the ability on this favorites page here to put whatever we want on. It doesn't have to be. Um, you know, fully populated at the moment. I've got three icons on there, as you can see. And this is uh, this is pretty straightforward to do. So let's get started. I'll I'll start talking about the, the user interface and this uh, this homepage that we can see here. 
So first off, um, we're on our favorites page. Now, uh, again, as mentioned, we can set this up however you want. So at the moment, we've just got a nav chart, a radar and a wind page. So say we want to add a sonar. So we're going to either do a bit of fishing or we just want to have a, an idea of the seabed when we're going to anchor. What we can do is we can press and hold and that will automatically populate into our favorites page. Favorites page. If we want to get rid of it, we just press and hold again and ask us, do we want to delete it? And we say yes. So something I should have mentioned is that the majority of the GPS map series is touchscreen. Um, back in 2007, when we released that first product with a homepage called the 5008, that was touchscreen. So we've had, uh, what's that, 13 years experience with touchscreens in marine industry. Again, first ones, Garmin, first ones to the market with it. And we continue to be market leaders um, and, and innovative the whole way since then. Okay, let's have a look at the next option down then. So smart mode. Um, I won't be able to show you this now because this is, um, so if you've got, um, as I say, a power boat or, or even a, a yacht with um, twin helms, you might have two screens side by side. What this does is it allows, it allows you to create a profile. So if you leave the marina, or you're entering the marine, you might choose docking. And that will change not just one screen, but the whole station together. So you don't need to say, right, I want this screen to be charged, I want this one to be radar. You just press that one button, it'll automatically flip. This is actually showing a combination here. So we've got our chart in the top left, our wind angle, which you can add by a wired or wireless wind sensor, um, and then our cameras. So there are three types of cameras. Um, composite video we connect in by uh, composite video connection, of course. Uh, IP, which connects by network, uh, and a wireless version as well, which you can connect by Wi Fi, so no need to run any wires. Um, we do HD, and they're all infrared as well, so you might put them over your, you know, the back of your boat like this, or you can have them in the engine room uh, in case of uh, problems in there, and they work in the dark. Okay, so we can easily set up a home page. We just go to menu, add layout. It'll blank off the screen, and this is the same as you set up a combination page as well. Uh, I'll show you that in a second. So we go in here and we just choose what we want. So we'll have a nav chart, and we'll have a, a radar, and we'll choose range A. That's just whether it's zoomed in or not, or zoomed out. And you can say whether you want to prioritize. So we can have the nav chart as a priority or the radar, vice versa. So we can also then name that whatever we want as well. So if we want to have an option. You know, if we clear that and we say, right, this is the option we're going to use when it's foggy. Again, so when you need it, again, when it's foggy, you don't want to be messing about and having to press lots of different options. All you do is you go to this option and you click fog and it gives you what you need there and then. And again, this is for use when you've got multiple screens. We can set this up so that we can have, and I'll take us on to the next uh, tab, combos. So this is where we can set up uh, individual combination screens. So rather than just having a full screen like we did with charts, again, we can have a, a split. We can have, uh, as I think it says, let's have a look. So if we go to add combo and we choose layout, we can have uh, a multitude of splits there. So, you know, you can have four, on the larger screens, you can actually have a, a six way split, but you've got uh, up to four on these. So. If, yeah, we say we'll choose, a, let's go for a three-way uh, split on here. So we can move that around again, so we can prioritize each screen as well, which is a, actually, it seems straightforward, but it's a really nice feature to have. So we'll put a, a nav chart in there, and let's put a radar up in the top, um, range A again, and we'll put a sonar page in the bottom right. So, um, you know, as I say, you can set that up however you want. Also, these data fields can be along the top or, or in the sides if you want to. And we can also change them really straightforward, uh, really easily. So we just press and hold, and you can put whatever it is you want in there. We've got a plethora of information. It really just depends on what you've got connected as to what you want to show. So that's a bit on combos. Um, all right, let's go on to charts then. So if we go into, uh, we can see we've got a various uh, number of different charts here. Um, Please don't worry about this for now. Uh, this is showing us something that is available in the United States. Um, it's called XM Weather. Uh, they have XM Weather satellites over the 
over North America. We don't have them in Europe, um, so ignore that. Uh, it's not uh, a feature at the moment. Nav chart, let's go on there first. So first thing we'll look at, when it comes to screen size, um, the bigger is better, I'm afraid. And the reason for that is um, when you zoom out, your spot soundings disappear because they'll become too cluttered if you've got them all uh, showing. And the bigger the screen, the more detail you will see at a higher zoom level. It's also good when you're splitting it up as well, you know, into different combinations. So if you can go bigger, you can fit it in, you can afford it, then I would recommend it. There is a value in doing it. Okay, let's look at some of the, the chart features. Um, as you would expect, uh, we've got uh, the, sorry, I'll tell you about the chart just first of all. So um, a couple of years ago now, Garmin bought Navionics, um, a, a worldwide, you know, really strong brand in charting. Uh, and that has now been amalgamated into our blue chart charting with G3. So it's a mixture of what we had with blue chart with Admiralty and also the Navionics content as well. So it gives us the best of charting, um, you know, across across the the marine industry. So if we click on one of these panel markers, it gives you the lighting sequence and so on as well. We can actually set that up so it will flash on your chart um, in real time, so you can get an idea visibly of what it will be doing. I'll set that up in another view in a moment. We can see our boat is uh, uh, marked by uh, this boat icon here as well. We can actually change that, have a triangle if we want to instead. Um, but we'll leave it as the boat icon for now. So let's have a look. Uh, as you could, um, you may be aware, all of these numbers are spot soundings. Now these can be changed in any unit we want to. So we can have that as uh, feet, fathoms, meters, or whatever it is. What we can also do, though, is we can switch on tides. So these depth contours are set in lowest astron astronomical tide. That means they're the lowest tide that you would expect over, I think it's 20 years or something, and it's what's drawn on your paper chart. So what we need to do to get an actual estimation of the tidal height we then add on the tidal height above those numbers. So we would often go to an almanac or a tidal chart, to a tidal guide to get those. We don't need to do that. It's in the chart plotter. So we click on the chart. We've got this quick menu across the top. We go to information and then we go to tides. It gives you a list of local stations. We're just off cows here, as we can see. And whoops, sorry. Go to information tides and then cows, cows. And we can see. Right now, we're just after high water. This crosshair, uh, 7.30, 3.4 meters above whatever's written on the chart. We can also move the crosshair. So if we're gonna get into somewhere, you know, around nine o'clock, we can move that to then. We see we've got 2.7 meters above and it's dropping. Uh, so if you're going in summer tidal, you can work out whether it's gonna be suitable to go in or not. So you just add whatever that, that tidal value was on there and you get the estimation. Be aware that uh, um, pressure, atmospheric pressure, will affect tides. So leave a bit of uh, factor safety. High pressure, the water level will be a bit lower, and vice versa. We can also see on here um, if we go over to CalShot and we zoom in a little bit, we've got these animated tides. So if you don't want to go through the menu, you can literally just click on there, and it'll say 3.5 above whatever's on the chart. So you can get that really quickly. And you can see from the down arrow, it's dropping and it's just below high water. The other thing we might want to know, um, possibly more for the sailor, but it's still important for power boats. It'll save you fuel and uh, not to be going against current. And what we can see here is the way the tidal flow is flowing. So we've got these arrows. Actually, let me zoom in a little bit. So we've got these arrows and they show the direction of current. If we click on it, what we can see is there's 2.5 knots tide running uh, towards the west there at the moment. So it's good, good to go west right now. But what we can do is we can click on the chart and, sorry, we'll stop panning, click on the chart. Ah, sorry, hold on, let me just switch it on. So if I go to a chart and I go to tides and currents, oh, sorry, the slider should be on. There we go. So 
So if we now go back, we've got this uh, tidal flow slider here. So we can move the time forward by pressing the plus button, or we can just slide it up with uh, the touch screen. And if we click forward, we can see the tide is on a turn between 11 and 12. So we know when it's going to change. And again, any of those times, we just click on the arrow and we can see what the rate of tide is. So we get those tides from um, tidal diamonds, which you would get in an admiralty chart. So that's just interpolated uh, to work out what the, the speed and so on is. And it'll do that over our hourly integers. Okay, so let's go on to our next kind of chart. So what we can see is we've got uh, a fishing chart here. So as you would expect, this is for the fishermen. Now what it does is it takes out a lot of the contours that we might have on a navigation chart that we don't necessarily need for a fishing chart. And what we can see is if we go off to the south side of the Isle of Wight, you can see the huge amount of depth contours we get there. That shows there's a uh, a peak going up from what looks like 60 meters up to 20 meters. So that's quite a, a large incline there. We might get fish swimming along there. So that could be a good place to fish. And you can see the amount of information that we've got from our, our sonar chart. This is where, sorry, our fishing chart. This is where uh, the Navionics um, charting really comes into its own with the amount of detail you get. You can get. Now, if you think I think there's a there's a, a trough there, something that's not in the chart. You can actually survey it yourself. We have a feature called Quick Draw Contours. Uh, now I won't do it now because it won't work, but we can record our own depths. So if you've got any type of transducer, it doesn't matter. You can record that in 30 centimeter one foot intervals. And so you can just go up and down and it will record your own seabed. You can have that overlaid if you want, or you can have it just recording in the background. We also have something called Quick Draw Community. What Quick Draw Community allows you to do is to either save your recorded contours um, and share them with the cloud. Now, you don't have to, you can keep them for yourself if you want to. Um, but we do have lots of ambassadors who are out there recording um, both inland and at sea, and end users as well who want to share them with everybody. Um, recording contours and posting them on the Quick Draw Contour community and you can then download them from there and overlay them in your chart if you want to. So there's not really too much more to go into the fishing chart there. The, the thing is, you just get so much detail. So it's, it's great for seeing the underwater um, contours. OK, next we've got 3D chart. So this is like a modern version of a highway page. What it does is it will give you a really good visual representation of where you should and shouldn't be going. So we can see around here is Calshot Spit. Um, we've got Bramble Bank in the middle of the Solent here, and we can see it's shallow on the east side of it, and the North Channel is running there. So it gives you a really good idea of where you should and shouldn't be going. And we can see there's a uh, ride bank there by the look of it. And if we spin around, we should also see the Medina River with the breakwater there as well. Something you'll notice if we hit stop panning, we go back right at the front, is you can see all of the channel markers are actually flashing at the correct sequence. So at night, you might actually be looking at something like this, if we zoom in, out through the front window of your boat or over the side of your sailing boat. And that's what you're likely to see on the horizon. So it gives you a really good reference for your eyes that you can see. So if I look off to the left here, about 45 degrees, I will see that channel marker with that sequence. So you might not use this on its own, you might, but you could use that in a combination with a nav chart. I think that's where it's really effective. As we can see, the channel's going right up here, right up into Southampton Water, and there's the Hamel River and so on. There is another view of this as well. So if we go into uh, settings, we've got style here. Uh, we can have it with charts as well. This is a view I quite like because it also gives you your depth contours on there too. So if we zoom out a bit, you can see you get all of your depth lines and so on as well. Similar sort of uh, uh, you know, perspective view to the other version. Okay, um, radar overlay I'll come on to in a moment when we're talking about uh, a, a brief touch on uh, radar. 
All right, let's move on to root creating them. So, say you want to create a root, let's go around to Benbridge on the east side of the Isle of Wight. So if we zoom in, let's go in a little bit. So we just go off the point here. So there's there's a few ways of creating roots. Um, as we can see along the top, we've got our, our quick menu. Go to will keep, take you there. That's if you want to create a straight line. So, you, um, you know, if there's no obstructions in the way and you just want to create a quick route, you just do go to and that'll take you as a crow flies. Route two is a manual route which marks your end point. So you actually work from the, the end point first and then work your way back. So we'll just take a, a little bit out there and then we'll go to, let's say, outside the fort and we'll zoom in a little bit. And we'll add a turn. And then if we zoom out and we pan across, Okay, and we'll put a we'll finish it there. What we can then do as well, if you have an autopilot connected, you can then steer that autopilot uh, or get the autopilot to steer that route for you. So we've created the route, as I say, that was by the route two method. Um, if we want to, so we don't actually need that turn. So what we can do is we can edit that, and we can delete it. Easy as that. Or if we want to put one in, so we can say, right, I want to go a bit further out. Here, uh, I'm just going to click on that, add turn, and then drag it out and click and then add it. And that's it. So it's really easy to modify that route rep, rep, rep respectively as well. The other thing we can edit a turn if we want to move it. So we want to go a bit further off the fort there. We can just do that and click add, and that's it. And then we create the route. Now, what we can see if I go back to the 3D chart is now we can see. That's where our sort of highway page comes in, and you can see relative to your route where you are, um, and it'll show things like cross track error. We then get all of our navigational information pops up on the side. Um, so we've got you know distance bearing, time to next, all that sort of stuff as well. It also tells you what you're doing at the next turn. So next turn is two degrees to starboard. If we want to know the bearing and distance on each leg, we just click on the, the route and it shows you 5.4 miles at 106 degrees. And if we want to know what's happening at No Man's Land Fort, we click on the route line on the turn and it says, so at that point, we're going to be turning 63 degrees to starboard. Gives you a good idea on a sailing boat if you might be hoisting a spinnaker or something on the next leg. Or if we click on there, it gives you the bearing 171. So if we cancel that route, so we just go to menu and then stop navigation. Do we want to save it? I won't do this time. There is another option which is really quick. So all we do is, let me zoom in. We click on there and we go auto guidance. And it's as simple as that. That's it, we've created a route. We can zoom in, we can have a look at it. Before we go ahead, that's absolutely fine. Say we want to put in a via point, for example. Again, we don't need to, but let's, let's just show you how it works. We can say just path, click on it, and then hit done. That's been a new addition actually in the last few years that we've uh, we've been able to modify uh, the auto guidance route. The other thing as well you can do now, so if we click adjust path, you can actually modify it and go from a different place. So if you're creating a route for tomorrow, say we're going from Cowes to Benbridge tomorrow, we can create the route from the entrance of the Medina. And when we're done, then it's created. We can also then save that route as well. So if we start it, then we'll be able to uh, travel down that route. So let's say we, we have arrived in Denbridge and we think, I've never been in there before. I wonder what it's like. We would normally get out an almanac to have a look at, to see what the, um, the layout of the marina is. We don't have to do that. This is built into our G3 vision chart. So that's the high-end version of the uh, the, the marine or the Garmin charting. So we zoom in here and we've actually got a photo of the marina. So uh, a, a panoramic photo uh, of the marina. So you get an idea of what to expect. If you say, you know, it's the second pump in the left, then you know you're going in there. So it gives you a, a better idea of what to expect when you go in. So there's one final uh, way of creating routes. I'm just going to show you really quickly. Um, if you're if you're racing 
Um, for example, you wouldn't create a route in either of those two ways. You do it from the beginning to the end. So if I stop the nav navigation, uh, I won't save it at this time. But what we can do is we can say info. Now you can load all of your waypoints in here previously, you know, um, in the store, and you can download them uh, from Cars Online. Um, but you know, you might have your local clubs uh, waypoints in there that you can put on here. So if we go into user data, routes and auto guidance, and we hit new, and then we can either using it, uh, we can do it from the chart, or we can do it from a waypoints list. In this case, we'll just do it from the chart. Um, one piece of advice on this as well is put the start line in because it will route better throughout the race. Okay, so let's say our start is just off. Well, we'll put it just off cows on the, the start line there. I'll just do it roughly. So let's go for a oops route using chart. So I'm going to start there and add a turn and say we're going to go over to. Uh, let's go for East Bramble. Okay, so that's the first leg, and then we're going to go across to. Uh, let's say we'll go over to Creed Bank, and then we go back to on up to Gill Kicker or whatever that is, and add a turn, and then we go the whole way back to the Cow Star Line. That's probably a terrible course, but anyway, it shows you how you can set it up. So if we add that turn and then we click done. So this is just named as a route at the moment. We can, whoops, so if we go back and we um, review it and then edit it, we can then, sorry, that is the wrong route. Uh, it's that one that we just created. So if we go to, um, sorry, if we go to review and then we go to edit route and then we can name it whatever we want. So if we call it race, One, that's fine. So now that's called race one, and we can navigate it. So it's as easy as that. As I say, you can also do it from a list of waypoints as well. Okay, so moving on then, if we go on to our sonar page, now uh, we are this simulator hasn't got all of the sonar that we we want uh, that we we have available. Um, one thing that we do have is something called Live Scope, which is um, multi beam sonar that actually gives you live information. There's nothing like it in the market. If you want to see more about it, there's a really good webinar uh, online from a US colleague. And if you Google live scope webinar, um, you should be able to download it. And it's uh, it's very good. It's on the, the use and installation of it. And I'll show you some imagery and so on. Um, there's, as I say, there's nothing else like it out there. Um, but to give you a quick idea of what we've got here, uh, traditional sonar is what we've as well as it says traditional what we've had for around around for a long time uh this uh we we offer something called chirp and that works across lots of frequencies if we go on the clear view here uh this is a, a higher frequency again so traditional sonar normally works around about 200 kilohertz this works at 455 so it gives you a more picture like kind of view of the seabed and this is really good for searching for seabed structure traditional is more uh, appropriate for searching for actual fish. Then we've got something called side view, and that shows us what's either side of the boat and the seabed. So again, if we're looking for seabed structure, this is really good to use. And you might use those in a combination. You know, if we go back to combo, we can have, uh, let's see, we can have all three of those shown on one page at a time, and you can prioritize those depending on what you want. We've also got something called UHD sonar now, which is ultra high definition. And that works at super high frequencies. Side view, you know, it goes up to 1200 kilohertz. So that gives you really, really good views of the seabed. But again, that's all I'm really going to cover on sonar at this time. Okay, radar. Again, we, the simulator won't actually show us radar, um, but I can tell you a few of the features of it without really showing you too much detail. Um, first of all, we offer something called. Uh, Oh, sorry, one of our one of our versions of radar is called the Phantom, and there's a feature of that called Motion Scope. And what that does is it gives you really good awareness of whether boats targets are coming towards you or moving away. So the Phantom radar is a Doppler effect radar, so it can work out whether 
the you know the waves are being compressed or expanded and then if the target's coming towards you it will paint it red if it's moving away it will paint it green and it'll do that automatically so you don't need to even you know lock onto a target to work out if uh, it's it's coming towards or moving away a few things we can do on here really easily is we can set up an electronic bearing line or, or a variable range marker. And what they do is they will give you an idea of, again, if you're on a collision course or something, if you mark that point and the target comes down that line, you're probably, you're gonna crash into it and you need to take avoiding action. The other things we can do as well is we can uh, acquire a target. It won't work here, but you can lock onto a target and it will then uh, a, a mark a target. Uh, and it will then track it and tell you its speed, heading, closest point of approach, time to closest point, point of approach. It will also show you that information on the chart and it will mark it with what looks like a shipwreck symbol uh, for the closest point of approach. And um, so it just shows you again, whether you're gonna be on a collision course or not. Uh, we used to have 10 of those, you can now do 20. For the long distance sailor, we have time transmit. So if you wanna save power, um, you can set it up to transmit every 10 minutes, half an hour, whatever it is you want. So it's not on all the time. You can also set up guard zones. So if anything comes within a certain range of you or whatever it is you want, uh, fore and aft or segmented just forward, it will give you an alert. These radar, again, all, everything on here is designed to be user friendly. So it's really designed that it will pretty much set the gain itself. You can change it depending on the conditions, whether you want auto high or auto low, or you can actually just scroll up and down depending on how much you want to increase the gain. Auto bird is for fishermen. It picks up flocks of birds, which are feeding on bait fish, which the bait fish are feeding on bigger fish. So you want to go towards them if you want to catch those big fish. Sea clutter works exactly the same. You can either have a low, medium, high, or high, depending on how rough it is. Um, or again, you can just Scroll up and down. Rain clutter the same. If it's raining heavily, then turn it up. If it's not, don't. Trails. So this is something we've added again, which sort of comes from the commercial radar, where um, we have, you know, it will just leave trails behind the the target um, or the vessel that you're tracking, and it will show you what way it's moving. It just gives again a better indication of where you're traveling. If you want to use MARPA uh, to acquire targets, you do require a heading input. Um, that has to be at least 10 hertz. And we've got two versions of heading sensors you can use. One is actually a really cost-effective version called the Steadicast. That, that's, um, it's only 100, and it's less than 200 pounds, 179.99, I think it is. And that will connect into NMEI 2000 network. Uh, you can also plug in, uh, if you want to go, if say you're on a, you know, a sailing boat and you want to get really accurate information uh, or you want to have a really accurate feedback for the compass for your uh, radar stabilization as well then you can use a nine axis heading sensor and that is uh, you know really accurate and it will also give you things like uh, um, your trim and pitch and roll and uh, stuff like that too which you can output onto the plot last thing i'll mention is uh, uh, the radar overlay so this is a really good tool for the Lexus pilotage and so on what it does is it overlays over your chart it should line up with the land and all the channel markers so it gives you a really good indication of how good your gps is if it lines up with the land um, then you know that your position is pretty good it is good um, same with channel markers and also if you're using ais input you will also get those targets showing up on your radar page so it gives you a, you know, another um, assurance that you know that those targets and your AIS is correct. And then, sorry, actually, dual radar allows you to actually have two zoom levels with different gain settings and all of that with one radar. So that's quite a nice feature too. The following video will give you a bit more information on motion scope.
finally then, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the ceiling features. So there's, when you set up the plotter itself, it will ask you for lots of information, not lots of information, it will ask you for some information, things like the draft and the air draft of your boat for the auto guidance settings. It will ask you for whether you're a sailing boat or a power boat and so on, and it will set it up accordingly. So if we go into our, our settings, um, so if we go to our homepage and settings, and then we go to my vessel, everything's in there with regard to water speed calibration, you know, um, temperature, depth, depth, offsets, that sort of stuff, and vessel type. So let's change it to sailboat. And then if we go back to our homepage and our nav chart, we can now see we've got a, a compass road and it's also got our true and apparent wind angles. We've got wind speed down here. And again, we can change that for more sailing information, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, but the first thing I'm gonna do is set up some ley lines. So if we go into ley lines, and there's a couple of ways of setting these. Um, so we're going to set up, the first is that we can choose to input the, the actual angle we want. So we've just put in 45 degrees uh, upwind and 165 degrees downwind. Now that's the easiest way of simulating it. But in, in real life, you might actually say actual. And what that will do is it will replicate what you're doing in the other tack. And you can set that up so it will either correct for tide or not. So it can work out what your, your drift is and your course of ground, and it can then allow for tidal flow, which around this area is uh, very important. So let's put on manual for now. Um, if we go back to the chart then, and what we'll do first of all, is we'll just set up a really uh, quick go-to. So if we go to West Knoll here, and we say go-to, what this shows us is our tacking angles upwind at whatever we set. The other thing we can show as well is, so let's change this value from position to distance of ley line. So now it gives us our distances. So on port, we need to do 0.28 of a mile. On, on starboard, we need to do 0.7. And that will shift around and get longer and shorter as the wind changes as well. The next thing I'm gonna try and show you, now this is a bit tricky to simulate in, in on an emulator, but we can set up a start line. Um, so for the racers amongst us, so if we say, Let's go into our combos page and we've got our steel racing option now it's popped up when we choose a sailing boat. Let's click in hold and add that to our favorites page. So we've got it in here now. So we go sail racing. What you would do is you would sail up to the committee boat at the starboard end, ping that, and then go up to the port end and ping that, and that would set up your start line. In this case, what we'll do is we'll um, just set it up in the chart uh, by, by clicking on it. The other ways you can do it is you can project the start line, choose one end, and then project it at a certain distance and bearing. First thing though is we'll go in and set it up. So with a lot of these functions, you need to have um, like a whole set of polar diagrams and so on to be able to work out what speed you're going to do and so on. We don't need that. All we need to do is go up wind before the start, work out what your speed's going to be. Uh, you can take a couple of tenths off if you want due to other boats being around you and getting up to speed. And you say, so let's put in our target speed. So we've got 5.8 knots. Target time will draw a box around the line on port and starboard ley lines to tell you how far you are from the line. So if you're inside that box, you'll be one minute from the line at your target speed, okay? The other thing you can do is you can set a power offset. So that is the distance from the front of your boat, which is gonna be the thing that's crossing the line first, of course, to the GPS. And at the moment, we've just got 12 meters in there. As you can see, you can also enter coordinates for the start line as well. So let's try and set it up. So we'll go to our nav chart and we'll stop panning back to our position. And if we click on the chart here, scroll across, we'll get our start line option. So I'm gonna set the, let's move it a bit up there. And I'll go to starboard and then I'll put the port option here. Okay, so that's our start line set. I'm going to try and simulate a bit of speed. Normally, this would be controlled by you just moving. Um, but if we go into our simulator and we just say we'll do, let's just do one knot, give me a bit of time to uh, to explain. So we go in, we've got our countdown timer here that you can easily change the time just by clicking up and down, and we'll click start. So um, this is the same with any combo page, actually. You can click on the combo page and then go full screen and it will show you in uh, the whole screen. 
So what this shows us, so as we said before, this is a one minute boundary. If we're inside there, we're one minute from the line at our target speed. So that says at about 5.8 knots, we are one minute from the line. What this is saying at the start time, we will be over, we will be here at our current speed. So if we go back, we can see that uh, we are, well, we've still got four minutes to go because we're only doing one knot. You know, we're, we're not going to get to the line until uh, for a little under four minutes. What we can do is we can set up the various different data fields here. So we can go distance to line. We can have um, time to burn, which we can have in there. What time to burn is, that tells us how much time we need to lose. So as we can see, we're going to be 59 seconds over the line. So we need to lose a minute, basically. The other thing we can do as well is we can go uh, time to line. So if we choose that, time to start line, then it will tell us how long we've got. So when that gets to 2 minutes 30, sorry, when that gets to 2 minutes 30, and the time to line is 2.30, we need to get going. This is obviously a wind a wind vane showing you uh, your true and apparent wind uh, angle in both directions. <coughs> Excuse me. So there we go. So if we put this down a little bit, it's going to be tricky to simulate. But where this, it's, it's difficult to explain with an emulator, but where it really comes into play is when you're coming in on the final run in. So say you want a port end start and you put your, the, this dot here and you're at full speed, you know you're good and you can keep going and you're going to get a perfect start. It works really well when you see it on land, or sorry, on, on the water. Another feature that we've got is this wind page. So this gives us the ability to track everything. You know, you can see your, your trends here. This would normally be a lot more linear. It's just uh, simulating. But you've got also things here like upwind VMG, downwind VMG if it's minus, opposite tack heading. So what you'll be doing on the opposite tack from what you're on and all that kind of stuff. And again, you can change those for anything you want. You can also view this. So we've got something called Active Captain. I won't go into this in too much detail. Uh, there's more information online. But one of the features of the GPS map is it allows you to mirror the screen through something called Garmin Helm that's based inside the Active Captain app. So you can um, view and control all of the information on your plotter. So you could have a look at your ley lines uh, in your charts. You could view all of this information through your iPad. It's also great if you don't want to you know, purchase a second station, you have your chart plotter at the helm and you have your iPad at the you know, at the uh, at the chart table to go down and create a log or something. We can go into my vessel and we can get all of our information there, you know, speed, heading, position, time of day. Note that down and you're back on deck again. So the other thing I was saying about there was mirroring uh, onto an iPad. You can also do something with, and this is where um, Garmin's range is widespread. We have something called a, uh, it's recently released, the Quadix 6. And I'll leave you with this. You can also connect in the Quadix 6 to the, the GPS map uh, without anything else, as you can do with a wireless wind sensor as well. Um, but you can connect in the, the, the Quadix 6, and it will allow you to view all of your wind speed information, depth, um, you know, um, if you're in a power boat, you can even put RPM on there anything you want. So you could be sitting on the, you know, over the side of the boat and you want to know what the wind speed is doing. You don't have to go and look at the chart plot of the instruments. You just look at your wrist. Really popular um, piece of piece of kit. Now, a lot of, um, you know, racers are using it, but it's also as suitable for somebody who's got a power boat and you can even drive your autopilot with it. So to conclude, we've run through the user interface. Uh, there's lots packed in here, but you can set it up just for you. You can have as little or as much as you want on this page. We've gone through our various different charts, creating routes, how easy it is to create routes. We can um, set up our start line or ley lines. Uh, we can get all of our almanac information in there. So tides and currents and overhead shots of marinas and ports. So hopefully that's give you a really good overview of the product. So I'm going to finish now by telling you very briefly about the Quadix 6 watch. It's our latest generation of marine smartwatch you're able to connect it to your GPS map plotter. 
to get all of the information that you would have in there onto your wrist. If you have a wind system connected to your plotter, you can display wind direction, speed, angle, all of that directly to your wrist. If you're a power boater and you've got engines connected, you can get RPM on there. You can even drive your autopilot from it. So it's available now. Check out this video.